Welcome to the Perspectives on Healthcare podcast, where members of the medical community from different roles, venues, and locations share their unique perspectives on quality healthcare, its future, and how to improve it. Now, from the Your Keynote Speaker Studio in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here is your host, Rob Oliver. Thank you, and welcome to another episode of Perspectives on Healthcare. Today's perspective comes from Rachel Hammond. She is from down in Texas. She is a registered nurse and the executive director of the Texas Association of Home Care and Hospice. She is a member of Generation X. And Rachel, welcome to the podcast. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity today. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about yourself and your role in healthcare, please. Absolutely. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Generation X, and um, I, by way of background, am a nurse. Um, so I have practiced in healthcare in a number of settings and I spent the large majority of my practice time um, actually in home care. Started out, of course, in the hospital and the ICU and ER and some of those places and then decided um, I really wanted to go into home care. A passion of mine was taking care of children, and I had the opportunity to um, take care of children who had gone home from the hospital um, and really needed some um, nursing care in the home. Uh, they were medically complex children uh, who needed uh, nursing care so that they could stay and live with their families at home. Okay. So that's so, how I got into home care. Right. So is that, is that, uh, like temporary nursing care or is that going is that like ongoing nursing care or mm -hmm. how does how does the home care work for so i'll just give you personal background for me um i get a lot of urinary tract infections and i am so delighted to be able to do the iv antibiotics at home and the visiting mm -hmm. nurse and it's a temporary thing uh right. is that is that kind of what you were doing or are there more permanent or more long-term opportunities in home care as well. So that's what's so wonderful about home care. It's very diverse. Um, pretty much anything that you can do in the hospital, minus a few things, obviously we can't do surgery at home, um, but it, it, we can do in the home care setting. So it can be visit based. It might be for a short term need. Maybe somebody fell, broke their hip, they need some temporary therapy. Um, it, it could be you know a temporary need for a child, let's say, um, they were born with a cleft palate and lip and need some help. The mom and the baby need some help um, learning how to, to eat, right? After that can be very short term, but then we might have um, people that have more long-term care needs where um, they might need ongoing assistance in the home uh, long-term. That can be for a child, it can be for an individual who's a senior, or a young disabled who needs ongoing help, maybe to um, be independent in the home um, and uh, participate in life in their community. So home care is a very diverse form of health care. It's really based on that individual and what that individual needs in order to stay independent and integrated in their community and with their family. Got it. Okay, so your association represents home care and hospice. What's the Correct. difference between home care and hospice? And can you talk a little bit about that hospice concept as well, please? Absolutely. So as I mentioned, it's very diverse. We take care of individuals from birth all the way through end of life. And hospice really focuses on health care in the home at the end of life. And so, you know, it's really helping someone um, pass away with dignity and comfort in the comfort of their own home rather than in the sterile environment, for instance, of a hospital or alone, um, let's say in a nursing home. So it really gives um, people that opportunity um, to choose um, how they want to live, live the last days of their life. And I would say that's very personal for me. Um, my mother-in-law just recently passed away in July at home mm. on hospice. And it was a choice that um, we as a family made together. And she really wanted to be with my husband and I at home 
um, in the last days of her life. And so we were able to um, be with her um, in those last days at home because of hospice. Yep. Now, my understanding is that hospice is, sometimes hospice is viewed as more of a, a shorter term thing. Like mm -hmm. you're looking at somebody who has a, a month or two months or something like that. It, mm -hmm. Am I properly understanding that sometimes it is a much longer, a much longer process than just to say, okay, we're waiting until somebody is nearing that that end of life situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are the what are the other options that it might be extended a little bit? Right. So it's really um, based on you know the individual's diagnosis, number one, and their choice of when they want to go onto hospice. So for instance, um, when we found out that um, the cancer uh, that my mother-in-law had came back and it was non-treatable, we decided right then to start hospice. And her diagnosis, I mean, was somewhere between two and six months. Um, she stayed a little um, uh, over six months on hospice. Some people choose to postpone hospice and decide, you know, I really want to try some curative measures first. And then if all of those fail, then um, I might be ready for hospice. And some people don't choose hospice at all. Um, so it really is uh, the length of time is based on an individual's diagnosis and really um, a, a lot on their choices. Got it. Okay. So what does quality healthcare mean to you? Well, that, that's a really good segue into um, what I consider quality because as um, I just said, um, a lot about home care and hospice is based on those individual choices. So first and foremost, um, you know, quality healthcare in my mind is that people have that choice of where they receive their care. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, obviously um, it's more than that, but that's um, a huge component is that um, people have the opportunity to make the choice. Where do I want to receive health care? And like I said, home care is health care in the home. It can be very, very complex. We take care of individuals who are on ventilators and um, to your point, who receive IV therapy services in the home, complex wound care. Um, and individuals who need um, long-term care and assistance with activities of daily living to remain independent in their home and community. So, um, you know, choice is a really big factor in where you receive your home care because it has a huge impact on your outcomes and your state of mind. And, um, and that truly does have a huge impact, I think, on uh, the quality of care. Um, likewise, a uh, quality workforce is extremely important. And um, home care has been struggling a little bit on, on that end, um, only because the funding for home care really has not, or, or has been somewhat neglected over the years, both at the state level and what we're seeing are cuts at the federal level. And um, we want to attract and maintain those quality individuals and those individuals who um, provide high quality care. And in order to do that, we need to ensure that we're paying them um, appropriately. And so, for instance, a nurse, um, we want to attract those nurses um, who provide quality services, but if they can get better pay, better benefits in a hospital setting, um, then we're not getting those individuals um, providing services in the home. Same thing with what, who, what we call direct service professionals or direct service workers um, or certified nurse aides. There's a number of ways that, um, or uh, names that we can use to describe individuals who provide services under the supervision um, of a nurse uh, for individuals who might need ser um, help with their activities of daily living, for instance, and seniors who might need assistance with bathing and dressing and their medication administration. And um, on the state side, individuals who provide those services, um, their rates right now are set through um, Medicaid and they are ex 
exceedingly low. Um, as we've seen um, and heard on the national news, um, workforce and the cost of, of work, um, the workforce is going up. And in, in home care, the starting wage is $8.11 an hour. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure you have seen the help wanted signs, even in restaurants, Chick-fil-A, um, Bucky's, Burger King, starting salaries at 16 to 18 uh, to $20 even an hour. And so yet we're asking individuals that provide complex, very personal, very important care to individuals in their home to accept a starting salary of $8.11 an hour. So as you can imagine, that presents a huge challenge for finding a quality workforce and ensuring that people have access to home care. Yep. It's so interesting because you have this dichotomy where the value, the value of the work and the impact of the work when it comes to the individuals that are served is so important and high, <laughs> and yet the financial remuneration for that is not being it's set not by you because you obviously mm -hmm. see the the value in what's being done there but it's being set by external organizations who whether or not they say they value the work that's being done the money that's being put to it gives a, the exact description to say we value it but we only value it at this level so uh, can you give me an example of quality health care? Well, absolutely. So, you know, in the home care environment, um, when somebody needs home care, um, it, you know, at whatever level that might be, um, that they're able to receive it in a timely manner. So, for instance, if um, you're in hospice care, um, something I recently experienced, um, as you know, um, and let's say that individual is getting closer uh, to the end of life and the family needs relief. They need um, crisis care intervention or uh, meaning that they need a nurse to be there for a longer period of time to give them a break um, during the um, active dying process. Um, quality means that that um, hospice agency is able to find that nurse and get that nurse there that day. And um, it is important when, um, let's say an individual is in the active dying process and the family um, might be exhausted from providing some of the care that that individual might need, that they get that relief right then and there. That's, that's a huge um, indicator of quality. Likewise, when an individual is discharged from the hospital, for instance, um, and they need to go home and um, they need uh, let's say some complex wound care, um, quality means that you're able to get a, a person there in a timely manner so that they don't get rehospitalized. Mm -hmm. So um, those things matter. Um, it matters that an individual, for instance, who provides long-term services and supports to a senior in the home is paid appropriately, um, and those rates are set, uh, again, by the state and by our state legislature, um, so that when that individual who needs, let's say, 20 hours of, of att attendance in the home, that they get those 20 hours because you have access to a workforce to provide that because what happens if if they don't get that is that um, maybe they were set up on medication reminders that attendance not there that day they don't remember to take their medication mm -hmm. the leading cause for seniors going in the hospital is not just falls but um, incorrect medications either they forget to take their medications or maybe they've forgotten they've taken it and they take too many and then they end up at the hospital. So um, there are a number of consequences to not having um, staff, available staff to provide the care needed in the home. Yeah, one of the things I wanna highlight in what you said is that there is the emphasis on making sure the patient is cared for, but you're mm -hmm. viewing the patient as a larger, 
is larger than just an individual. You're looking at the family mm -hmm. and the way that the Absolutely. family is is being uh, it, maybe taxed Impacted. isn't the right word, but the, the, that the way that the dynamics are handled there and the impact that it's mm -hmm. having. And so, you know, as as a speaker talking about quality, it's a reminder that it's about mm -hmm. patient and family centered care. It's more Absolutely. than just the individual. So uh, I think that's mm -hmm. very well said. What do you wish people understood about your role in healthcare? Well, that we're fighting every day on behalf of Texans and, um, you know, individuals that need care in the home. And, um, you know, that it's exceptionally important um, that people, again, have that choice to receive those services in the, co in the home are not forced if they're an individual, let's say, being discharged from a hospital, instead of going home to receive care, being forced into a nursing facility. Mm -hmm. um, every day that, let's say, an elderly individual stays away from their home, it becomes that much more difficult for them to go home. Um, and so it is not appropriate to force an individual who wants to go home to a nursing facility when they can receive care, um, the same level of care in the home. One, it's um, inhumane. Two, it is much more costly to divert individuals from hospital to a nursing facility when they can get that same level of care in the home. Um, and if we're talking about children, children should never grow up in facilities, ever. And so every family has the right to ensure that their child, if that child was born with a disability or born prematurely and needs nursing care, has that ability to take their baby home and to, and to um, raise that child at home. And the only way sometimes families can do that is with nursing in the home. Yep. So um, that is what we're fighting for every single day and something I'm extraordinarily passionate about. So you're preaching to the choir on this. Listen, I'm, I'm nursing <laughs> facility clinically eligible, okay? I, the state of Pennsylvania would pay for me to live in a nursing facility mm -hmm. and I'm fighting for my freedom every day and I receive services in my home to help make sure that I'm independent in the community. And I remember, I mean, my statistics are probably five or six years old, but there were 3,000 people in the state of Pennsylvania under the age of 21 who were living in nursing mm -hmm. facilities. And I completely agree with you that that is not an acceptable figure. So um, thank you for the work that you do and the advocacy that allows people to be uh, in their home instead of in a nursing facility. Uh, we've got two questions left and I've only got like mm -hmm. two or three minutes. So okay. we'll, move through these. What excites you about the future of healthcare? Well, um, what excites me is that there are more and more people that know um, about home care and hospice and know that they, um, they have the right to home care and hospice. That's exciting. What was troubling, obviously, we went through a huge pandemic. Um, hopefully, we're coming to the tail end of that pandemic. It is something that you know, COVID is something that we are going to have to learn to live with, I believe. Um, however, the most acute phase is over. But what it did do is it highlighted um, the, um, the necessity for home care and the impact home care has on the entire healthcare continuum. When hospitals were overrun with individuals and they were needing to get people out, who did they call? they called home care agencies. When they knew, when they were trying to, again, discharge people, um, they could not send them to nursing homes because nursing homes were closed. Um, and so they were trying to, uh, they, they were able to send them to home care. We were able to keep people safe in their home out of those congregate settings as well. So I'm excited to see that home care is getting some more attention. But what we need is that with that attention, we need appropriate funding, bottom line. We have two issues on Medicare. They are trying to take $18 billion out of the home care um, benefit right now. So what does that mean? That means seniors right now, starting next year, are going to have limited access to home care. 
through a rule that they just passed. So we're trying to pass the Preserving the Access to Home Care Act of 2022 um, so that we can reevaluate um, what we need in terms of payment for home care on the Medicare side. And then on the state law side, we need our state legislators to step up and um, appropriately fund uh, home care services and ensure that the healthcare workers are recognized for the very hard frontline work that they provide to individuals to and across the community. And we serve um, roughly about 500,000 individuals across the state of Texas alone yeah. in the community. And, and the thing that I will reiterate that you pointed out earlier is the cost factor. You can mm -hmm. serve people in the home. And again, you know, with my passion about home and community-based services, mm -hmm. uh, you can serve two people in their home for the cost of serving one pe one person in a facility. And Absolutely. when you when they're looking at making cuts to home care, the the issue is that it actually is a, there's a financial incentive to to treat people in their homes because it is more cost effective. All right, last question: What is one thing? medical professionals can start doing today to improve the quality of healthcare? Get involved. Um, you know, I know, um, you know, it is so busy um, in healthcare. Every healthcare provider is stretched, truly stretched to the brink. We are so short staffed in the home care world. Um, we have a huge nursing shortage that was exacerbated by the pandemic. Nurses are tired. They were worked very hard during the pandemic. And so um, to make substantive changes, you really have to get involved. And so um, if you wanna see healthcare improve, get involved, um, be a voice um, for uh, home care or hospice or um, any of the services that you might provide, whether it be in hospitals or nursing facilities, because healthcare is so important to so many. Um, so again, if you are in the uh, healthcare worker in the home care industry, uh, get involved, be a voice, talk to people. And um, we, we have a, a website that is there for the public. Uh, it's called savehomecare.org. And I would encourage people to go there to find out a little bit more about home care. What are the challenges in home care? Um, and to uh, find out how they can be an advocate and a voice for uh, individuals, their patients, their families um, that deserve that kind of care. Absolutely. And I'll make sure to put that link in the show notes mm -hmm. so that people can visit that and learn more. Listen, Rachel Hammond, thank you so much for being with me today. Absolutely. I appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate you sharing your viewpoint and I respect your perspective on healthcare. Thanks for listening to Perspectives on Healthcare. Visit PerspectivesOnHealthcare.com to learn more about Rob Oliver or to subscribe so you never miss an episode. If this podcast was valuable, we'd appreciate a review on iTunes. Or if you tell a friend or coworker about the show, that would be helpful too. Join us again next time for more Perspectives on Healthcare.